I'm going to hit the record button because we're going to um, have this also on our YouTube page. So there's lots of ways that people can come and watch this. So Yay. yeah, so that's always a good thing. So um, anyways, real quick here, I'm Julie Solvinsky. I'm the director of events at Warwick's. And we are here this evening with Sigrid Nunez and Jennifer Thompson. That's going to be a great conversation. I was telling Sigrid in the green room a little bit. I kind of fangirled on her a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we are huge fans of, of hers at Warwick's. We have tons of customers who just, I mean, The Friend was just one of those books that just was all of amazing. our favorites. Or is, it's amazing. Yeah. It's an amazing book. Um, so we're just, I personally am just thrilled that you're here with us tonight. So thank you for being here little bit about Warwick's. We, um, since the shutdown, we uh, have been open since mid-May and we are doing, so if you're so inclined to come into the store and browse around, we invite you to come in. We are doing masks and social distancing. And so um, it's always great to come around and see, um, uh, see the stacks of books and the beautiful gifts that Nancy has. So, um, but like I always like to say too, that if you are, um, any way that there is to get a book, you can get it from Warwick's. So you can order it online. I will be putting the book in the chat function. So you can just easily click that. We can ship it to you. You can pick it up at the store. You can curbside. And I always say this too, Jennifer, I know you're tired of hearing it, but if you live in La Jolla, we'll drive it to your house. So. And I like to say, we'll meet you at the beach. Exactly, exactly. So we will yeah. get you, we will get you that book. So, so anyway, so it's, um, like I said, any way that there is, um, so we appreciate the business. We appreciate everything. So we have some viewers. So I'm going to go ahead and start the program so we don't miss a minute of you two talking. And I'll do a quick introduction of Jennifer, and then I'll toss it off to you guys. Awesome. So. Jennifer Thompson is a personal branding expert, digital marketing strategist, and host of the Premise Podcast. She's an author and speaker who delivers strategy-rich content and actionable tools that educate and empower authors. She and her husband, Chad, co-founded Monkey See Media in 2004 and have been creating award-winning book cover designs and author websites ever since. Jennifer is the co-founder of San Diego Writers Festival. I think you guys renamed it. Did you rename it Writers Festival of San Diego or did not? No? Okay. We, no, still the okay. San Diego Writers Still Festival. San Diego Writers Okay. I saw a logo. Sorry, I'm totally interjecting here. <laughs> That's the Quite beauty right, of yeah. this. That's the beauty of this, right? <laughs> it's all live, yeah. It's all live and just like, whatever, let's have a chat. <laughs> That's um, right. She serves on the board of San Diego Memoir Writers Association and is currently writing her own coming-of-age memoir. So welcome, Sigrid and Jennifer, and you guys have a great conversation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Sigrid, this is such an honor. Your book is absolutely lovely. I'm, I'm going to introduce you, but I just wanted to say I'm so glad to be here, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's going to be. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I'm looking forward yeah. to it too. So for our listeners, Sigrid Nunez has published seven novels, including A Feather on the Breath of God, The Last of Her Kind, Salvation City, and The Friend, a New York Times bestseller, which won the 2018 National Book Award and was a finalist for the 2019 Simpson Joyce Carol Oates Prize. It has also been shortlisted for the 2020 International Dublin Literary Award. Nunez, Nunez's other books, have been shortlisted, I'm sorry, other honors and awards include a Whiting Writers Award, a Berlin Prize Fellowship, the Rosenthal Family Foundation Award, the Rome Prize in Literature, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Among the journals to which she has contributed are the New York Times, the New York Times Book Review, the Wall Street Journal, the Paris Review, the New York Review of Books, Three Penny Review, Harper's, McSweeney's, Tin House, The Believer, and The New Yorker. Her work has also appeared in several anthologies, including four Pushcart Prize volumes and four anthologies of Asian American literature. One of her short stories was selected for the Best American Short Stories 2019. Her work either has been or is being translated into 25 languages. Sigrid, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. So I would like to say your writing is simply stunning. Um, in, in this particular book, what are you going through? Our narrator is totally relatable. She's thoughtful, she's quirky, she's witty and dark and humorous and even a little messy, if I say so myself. 
What I like most about this book is that it feels a lot like a love letter to the human experience with all of the good and the bad, our pain and our grief and our fears, our triumphs, our hope, our lack of hope. And, and I wonder, it, you know, it all comes through loud and clear. I, I wonder, what was the impetus for writing this book? Well, um, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't plan out my uh, books before I write them, and I don't, I don't mm. start with an idea. I usually just try to jump in somewhere, and uh, so this book came after the friend, and so some time had passed, and it was time to start something new, and I just, you know, I just looked around in my head for somewhere to start, and it and it came to me to say. I went to hear a man give a talk. Hmm. It wasn't, I mean, you know, so I had committed myself to that. There's already two characters in that sentence. There's a narrator and there's a man. And then there are the questions you have to answer. Um, a talk about what, where is this talk? Is it in her hometown or somewhere else? And, and mm -hmm. then I had my narrator moving about. I figured I'd put her in a different town from her hometown and why is she there she's there to visit a friend who's in the hospital uh she stays at an airbnb so that's four characters now mm -hmm. um and you know i just then okay i had said he'd given a talk so i had to write the talk so i wrote the talk then i had to show the, the audience spot. reactions <laughs> yeah I, I do i just i just yeah i make it up huh. as i go along that and then I, is yeah, incredible. Then there was the woman who's in the hospital. Who's she and what's their relationship? And, you know, by then, if you keep going, you get to a certain point. You, you really have committed yourself already to all kinds of threads of story. Then mm. you write some more and then you're in the thick of it. And then you have to find a way to make those strands come together in some way that's a coherent story. Well, that is fascinating to me. It, it says a lot because I, I almost felt like when I was reading this book, sometimes I felt like a, a sweater was slowly unraveling. And then other times I thought, no, it's more like it's coming together because the threads so perfectly weave and, and answers come up, you know, as, as you're reading the book, you're like, who, where are we now? And, you know, we're literally following this stream of conscious conscience for this conscious for this woman who is just, you know, going about whatever is in her head and it feels almost jarring at first. And then pretty soon it like, it starts to feel comfortable. And, and if I could even say warm, um, I, I was really curious how you managed to bring it all together. So I find it fascinating that you, they came to you as you wrote. Are you one of those writers who feel like your characters reveal themselves to you as you're writing? Yes, and I've never written anything not in that fashion, so I was already comfortable with that. But furthermore, I was aware from the very beginning, practically with that first line, that the narrator was the same narrator as the friend, basically. It was the same voice, the same sensibility, the same way of looking at the world. So... Mm. You know, so I mean, those, it, it's, not, it's not a sequel to The Friend, it's not a continuation of The Friend, but it's very close to The Friend, and it mm. came out of The Friend. That became very clear to me. So, mm. um, so I was comfortable with writing like that, and then because, I've always, because this is the way I always write a book, mm. you know, I have to have some faith that once I start moving along, things will happen as you said, you know, that it will somehow, it will it will come together. I will, I will find a way to bring these things together. And in this case, um, you know, because she starts out with the, the lecture that she hears and the friend that she's visiting in the hospital, uh, you know, then, she, then there's a certain amount of time where she talks about certain encounters that she has with other people, but then the focus narrows down to that person mm -hmm. that she was visiting into the, in the hospital who has gone from having a a diagnosis of cancer to having a terminal diagnosis. And then, you know, the, the, the focus gets tighter and tighter, and then that's really what it's about, these two characters. But the person who gave the lecture also comes into it. 
So I wonder, and forgive me because I haven't read your previous books, but I will. I, I, I absolutely will. No, I really you. enjoyed this book. <laughs> yeah. You. Do all of your books, you know, you did not name the characters. So, you know, throughout the entire book, we never know. We say my friend or the man or the woman. And so everyone is, you know, brought in simply as a person that she has encountered, but they never get any deeper than that. And yet it's much more intimate because of her internal thoughts. Are all of your books like that? When did you decide these people won't have names? No, I, my first book has an unnamed narrator, um, but all of the other characters have names. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a, it, it's, you don't, you don't feel, you don't, since it's in the first person, and that first person narrator never says, by the way, I, you know, and then, and then states a name, but everyone else has a name. And then in, okay. in the next several books, uh, the characters had names. Uh, in The Friend, what happened was, again, I, I don't plan these things ahead of time. They really do happen while I'm writing. I didn't plan not to have names of characters in that hmm. book. Um, what happened was that I mean, they did have names. I mean, I don't think I had named everybody, but I was at a certain point, I was into the book, maybe maybe a fifth into the book or whatever, and people did have names. And it just wasn't working. It just, it just, um, it, it just wasn't convincing. I, I, I uh, it, it's hard to explain, but when I was trying to write while these characters had names, or some of them did, I found myself getting stuck and, 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 the, mm. and, and not fluent anymore. So I took the names out and, uh, and then the problem was, was, was solved. Now, now I have to say, this is so much not just me. This is really a very, very common thing now with contemporary writers, not naming the characters, not naming the narrator. Um, and, um, you know, and there, it just, there seems to be some, some discomfort with the names and, and, uh, mm. and, 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 just a, a feeling that it, it feels somehow more real without those names. Uh, so with this book, because of what happened with the friend, I did not even try to name the characters. I tried, you know, I thought, well, if, if I'm going on and it becomes too clumsy, yeah, then I might, then I will have to name them. But I, it, that didn't, that didn't happen. Uh, and then in, in the friend, the character that has a name is the dog has a name. And I always knew the dog would have a name. <laughs> uh, and in fact, in fact, there is a, there is a, there is a cat in my in my uh, new book, and the cat has a name, so the animals get names. Um, I I, I really. That's about. <laughs> I think I think I do. I love that. I mean, I, we love to anthropomorphize our animals, right, and give them backstories. And in this particular book, there's a scene where the cat gets to tell its story, this entire backstory of how it came to this new home. And for me, like, it was really satisfying. I imagine that was very satisfying for you to write that scene. It was, it was, and it was fun. It was fun. But I, I just had my doubts about it because it seemed very, very strange. Oh. Um, but it, it's but it, it's turned out that everyone has, everyone is very taken with that cat and that cat story. I you know for me I just I was including all kinds of stories, uh, by by humans about what they were going through, all different yeah. kinds of things. And then it just struck me when I came to that part where the cat enters the story and enters the room. Mm -hmm. It came to me to, to say well the cat would the cat has been through some things too. The cat has of a story course. too. And and, yeah. and and it was very easy to imagine a story for a rescue animal. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was it was it was fun to write and it was satisfying. But I, but I, I did I did feel it was a, a, an odd an unusual thing to do to include an animal in the story. Well, I appreciated it. It made me wonder. I imagine that you must have rescue pets yourself. I don't. I don't. I don't. Well, right now I don't have any pets, but I certainly okay. have had pets in the past. Well, I appreciated the fact that he was a rescue animal, a rescue cat in particular in his story. You know, you, you said something that strikes me as interesting, that you weren't sure that people would accept that. And when I first started reading this book, I know I said, you know, the stream of conscious at first, it's a little jarring because you're trying to find place and you're not sure where it's going or who these people are. And as it's slowly unraveling and the threads are coming together, again, is it an unraveling or a coming together? I'm not sure which. I think it's a coming together in the end for me. 
But I just wonder, did you ever stop and think, is anyone going to read this book that the characters don't have names? And, and did you ever doubt that it was going to work? Not about the, the, the names. I didn't think there would be a problem. Well, the story with itself, not the names necessarily, but the whole thing, the stream of conscious and how it was, how you were delivering the, the story, the arc to the reader. I, I always have that feeling about, about writing a book. I always think, I don't know, writers, writers have this, this, this little, this little Is demon. Is it going to work? Yeah, yeah, right. And the demon that sits <laughs> on your shoulder that, that, you know, that says, you know, that you're terrified that somebody's going to read it and, and think, why are you telling me all this? Mm-hmm. You know, that's your, that's the big fear that the reader's going to say, why are you telling, why should I, why should I be interested in this? So, but you, you know, you always have that. I, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be, you know, it, it probably would not be a good thing not to have some of that, um, you know, to, to think, oh, to, to have that sort of arrogance, like, well, of course, people are going to read this and buy it and pay money for it and write great reviews of it and love it and, and tell everyone, you know, et cetera, about it. It's just that would not, you know, they, it's really, could, that could really work against, against you, I think. I think you're probably right. But, you know, as a writer myself and a, and a reader, the whole time I thought this works so perfectly. She must have known she had a masterpiece when you were writing it. Not so much. No. <laughs> I wouldn't think that, no. How much rewriting was involved in this book, in the telling of this book? Well, well, the thing is that, you know, as I said, I always start with something at the beginning and then I, I carry on, right? So mm-hmm. um, I don't make outlines or drafts or anything like that. So what I do is I, I write a certain number of pages and I try to get them as, as good as I can. And that might be 10, 15 pages. And only then do I move on to the next little section of 10 to 15 pages. And I, I creep along like that, sort of groping intuitively to the end, mm. um, making everything up as I go along. So, so I am revising it over and That's over. Right. Every time I sit down to write, I am revising it. So, you know, mm. draft after draft, but always in progress, not like writing a full draft mm. and then going back. And so by the time I finish it, it, it really is finished. You know, I might have some more, more work to do on it, but it's, it's not like other writers who just say, no matter how, how rough it is, I just have to get the whole thing down first. Yeah. And I'll work on it. That, yeah, that, I've never written anything like that. It's always been the same linear process. I'm glad to hear that because you always hear, you just got to get it all out on paper and you can go back and finish, you know, fix it later. And I find that to be very difficult if I don't fix while I'm writing. So I'm, oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. You know, I, I, I know that I would have, uh, it, would, it would just cause me so much anxiety to have mm-hmm. that much bad writing sitting right? there. But, um, yeah. And I even, I even used to have, you know, in this a completely absurd uh, anxiety that was like, you know, the, what, what if, what if I, what if I die and then they discover all these terrible pages and they think she was a terrible writer. <laughs> Look at this, I can write a sentence. It That's was just the so... idea of, of having that, that bad, bad stuff exist for anybody to see really yeah. does cause me serious anxiety. You know, I only want it now. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Oh, I love that. You know, <clears throat> I wonder some, if you as a person, like how much of you, you know, we, we write what we know. So I just can imagine you at the grocery store or in the line at Home Depot, and you're the kind of person that people just come up and tell you their stories. And by the time you get to, you know, pay for your item at whatever line you're in, you've heard the whole life story of the person behind you. Does that happen to you a lot? It does, it does happen. It does happen. I mean, I think, I think, um, because I'm very curious about people and because I really do like to hear people's stories. Mm-hmm. I like to hear people mm-hmm. talk. And I also like to talk. I mean, I like, it's just not all just a one way, a one way situation. Um, and um, yeah, there's always, there's always something to think about. There's always material there, even if it isn't something that you can then use in a book or a story. But, you know, the more that happens, the more you understand how humans behave and yeah. respond to things and, and yeah. what human experience is like. Um, and since that's, you know, what I write about, that's, that's where my books come from, writing yeah. about what I observe about, about human experience. 
you know, I can't really get too much of that. I, I can understand if you, if you weren't a writer where, where that could be, you know, something that you would have no interest in, even if you were a very, you know, empathetic person, but it, it just wouldn't be, you would rather learn about other people from reading books or going to movies or something like that, where of course you can learn a lot, but you don't necessarily want to, uh, you know, to, to, to hear people's stories in the supermarket or something. Well, you know, there's one point, actually it happened a couple times where our narrator is, is listening to a story that someone is telling them, telling her rather. And all of a sudden the teller says, is this boring you? Am I going on too long? She says, oh no, no, I'm very interested. And, and then she tells the reader, I really am. I love hearing people's stories. I'm eternally curious. And it made me think that you must be a, an eternally curious person as well to be able to convey this in such a believable way. And it, it made the narrator, I think, so endearing to me that she wasn't just telling us this thing, these things she'd, she'd seen. Like for example, she's in a cafe and she overhears a conversation. We only hear a snippet of it, but you know, we get a sense that there's something, there's some, something dramatic happening and you know, she cares. She cares about these complete strangers and you get the sense that she hopes it turns out well for them. And as she's kind of navigating you know, her, her life, we get to experience the depth of her warmth and her compassion and her empathy and her curiosity. And I loved that. I think one of the things I'd like to ask about that was really cool to me was the unspoken sharing of thoughts. So for example, she's having a conversation and she says, she tells the reader, and then I thought to myself, and then the, then the man thought to himself, and then, I, you know, so like they're thinking back and forth and, and you get the sense that she can tell what he's thinking simply by body language. Tell, tell us a little bit about that technique. Well, there, there are just a couple of places in the book where, as I say, as I was writing, it came to me uh, to have an unspoken line of dialogue, mm -hmm. which is then responded to unspoken, unspoken. by the yeah. other person. Yeah. So, so at a certain point when she, she is visiting her friend in the hospital and they fall silent, and I, I, I have the, the woman who's ill, excuse me, I have the narrator say, I have the narrator not say, um, uh, right, right. however will you get, however will you get through this? I didn't say, um, I have no idea, she said back, if she didn't say back. I mean, she's so, so that n neither one of them have said this out loud, um, but it, it has been communicated somehow. Mm -hmm. So there's just a, a, maybe that. three places where I do something like that. And it's not overdone. Like you, you do it perfectly. You bring it to the reader perfectly in a way that adds that intimacy. I think that's like, if I were going to use one word to describe that book, it'd really be intimate. You know, that connection between humans is really well done. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I think I'd like to, if you don't mind, have you read an excerpt? Do you mind reading for us? Okay, no, I, I, I'm, I'm happy and ready to do so. Okay. Uh, I, I, I just, I just need to, to, to set, sit, set this up please, a little. Please do. Okay, this is the, the narrator and her friend, um, her, her friend who has the diagnosis of terminal cancer. They are staying together in this house. And at this point, the, um, the friend who's ill has been having a lot of trouble reading because of her concentration, her concentration is so poor. So she's asked the narrator to, to read to her. And so they have just finished um, the end of a mystery novel. And now the question is what to read next. I had some recently published novels on my Kindle, but my friend wasn't interested in listening to any of them. She didn't like what she called the vandalizing streak in contemporary fiction writers. She quoted John Cheever on the difference between a fascinated horror of life and a vision of life. Nowadays, it seems to be mostly fascinated horror, she said, either that or totally unconvincing platitudinous sentiment. All these books about the horribleness of modern life, she said, a lot of them brilliant, I know, I know, you don't have to tell me. 
but I don't want to read any more about narcissism and alienation and the futility of relationships between the sexes. I don't want to read any more about human, in particular male, hideousness. Whatever happened to Faulkner's idea that a writer's job was to lift people up? How Faulkner chastised the young writer of his day. He writes as though he stood among and watched the end of man. He writes not of the heart, but of the glands. It was out of fear that the writer wrote this way, Faulkner said, the fear he shared with every other person on earth, the fear of being blown up. But it was the writer's duty to rise above such fear, Faulkner said. Valor was what Faulkner was calling for that day in Stockholm in 1950. And then a return to the old universal truths love and honor and pity and pride and compassion and sacrifice, absent which, Faulkner warned, your story will last but a day. Mm -hmm. Fine words, really fine words, but of all the ways of looking at a writer today, as a knight in shining armor strikes me as probably the most far-fetched. How about this, I said, pulling a heavy book from the bottom shelf the world's best folk and fairy tales, gods and heroes, princes and peasants, giants and little people, witches, tricksters, and animals, animals, animals. This would be our reading from now on. She could not get enough of it. <laughs> Much has been said about mystery stories being like fairy tales and popular for some of the same reasons. Instead of ogres, serial killers, and though they might not be pure of heart, no princes or Galahads or saints, the detectives are still heroes, righteous if not always noble avengers. All is simplified, characters, types, moral code, clear. Where, while, where guilt or innocence lie, plain. Plenty of cruelty, violence, and gore, but in the end the evil are vanquished, and even if the good don't live happily ever after, there is closure, the kind of closure that mostly eludes people in real life. Mm -hmm. Except that fairy tales are beautiful, my friends. <clears throat> fairy tales are sublime and mysteries are not. Another difference, unlike mysteries, fairy tales are not escapist. Even if they too simplify and conform to familiar formulas, the truths in fairy tales always run deep. That is why children love them. Who knows better than a child what it's like to be at the mercy of hidden and arbitrary forces and that anything can happen no matter how strange, either for good or for ill. Fairy tales are real. They are more mysterious than any mystery novel. That is why, unlike mystery novels meant to entertain, then be forgotten, fairy tales are classics. They are of the heart, not of the glands. Hmm. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I love how you pull in reference to a lot of classics and a lot of authors, Faulkner being one, Wolf, you talked about, uh, Infinite Jest was even brought up, which I thought was very clever considering your book is Stream of Conscious and, you know, and, and you bring in some of the Stream of Conscious writers. Um, I found it uh, just lovely how it all came together. But in terms of fairy tales, speaking of, um, do you have a favorite fairy tale? Um, I, I like any fairy tale that has swans in it. So there's six swans yeah i i that's probably my favorite that's a that's okay a, it's my narrator's favorite too and it's the favorite of the narrator so i wondered if it was in fact your favorite that, that's my that's my my favorite i think although you know i mean there's so many of them and they are all so similar but that 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 i just remember from childhood being so so moved by that particular fairy tale right right did you feel comp compelled to, to bring Faulkner into the story because of how the, the book opens? It, it opens with this man giving this talk about how really we're doomed. The, the planet is doomed, the earth is doomed, you know, there's no hope. 
And, you know, Faulkner, Faulkner talks about how we have to give hope to our readers, right? Well, I didn't, you know, I, the, the, the um, um, you know, I'd, I'd written that talk for that man at the beginning. And then um, I don't actually remember why I, well, I've always known about Faulkner's idea about um, that the, 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 you know, people should be writing stories, writers should be writing stories that lift people up, that that's the, the purpose. Uh, but, it, but at that point, then I, I looked up his, uh, his Nobel speech. And mm. and it and and realized that it actually was perfectly suited to my purpose here, so mm. I I was able to, to to use it there. But I had I really didn't again I didn't make the connection until I was actually right there at that point mm. where, where I remembered him saying that about about uh, whatever happened to his idea that you know fiction should be should lift us up, right. Would you consider yourself a pessimist or an optimist? Well, I tend to, I have a very, I'm, I tend to be a pe pessimistic. I have a very strong pessimistic streak. You know, I think that I, I inherited that from, from my mother who was extremely pessimistic. Um, mm. So yes, I would, I would have to say that. I mean, optimistic about some things, but I certainly have a lot of pessimism there. So I find that that's interesting to me because ultimately while your book, I mean, the themes, there's grief, there's loss, there's growing old, there's losing your beauty and even, you know, your, your sense of self. I mean, there's so much of the human experience that we struggle with in this book. And yet at the end of it, I really felt like it was a, it was a love story. You know, it was, it was beautiful. And I did find at the end, I, I didn't feel burdened by the idea that we're doomed you know um and, and the grief felt very beautiful to me because it was a life well lived would you say that you know this was a more of a love story or i mean how would you categorize this book as a whole um is it crime and punishment or is it a love story right exactly um <laughs> and i remember i mean that's another quote that i that i love um from the filmmaker todd solons which is every story worth telling is a love story, mm -hmm. um, and but this, I, this is definitely uh, a love story, and it's a, mm -hmm. as you said, you use the word intimate. I mean, it's a, it's a story about an intimate friendship, and I mean, it's a love story in the sense that it's definitely about love, um, yeah, and um, and a kind of unexpected love. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So so yeah, I mean, I I, I think that. Uh, I think that that's a completely accurate description, and and you know it doesn't it doesn't mean that it's a you know it's I I don't think of it as either an optimistic or a pessimistic ending. I you know I do think that the the lecture couldn't be more pessimistic. Uh, the lecture sure, that, yeah. that, that you know that's where that starts the book out, um, but you know there the 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 uh, the experience of, of love that happens in the book is, is undeniable. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not a figment of anybody's imagination. It's a, it's a, it's a real emotion. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it can't, you know, you, whatever happens, no, nothing takes that away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like after the man gives the speech and all the people are pouring out of the theater, our narrator included, she's listening to and telling us about the experiences that these people around her were having. Some of them were angry, some of them felt sad, but that to me was sort of the whole point of that opening scene is how we react to the story, not the story itself. Well, yeah, I mean, um, you know, m my idea there was that there was something about that, I mean, that, man that lecturer is a tell is telling a story too he's telling a story of of, of what he thinks the future ha has in, in store for humanity mm -hmm. and um he has a style and the style is very off-putting so there are people who um who agree with the facts there are other people who were actually laughing at him to some extent um mm -hmm. because of his tone and and it's not silly for them to be laughing. I mean, there 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 was some. There is something comical about about the way he presents himself. 
Um, so, but, but the main thing is that his story, in a sense, isn't effective in the way that he is hoping. That's why he's going around lecturing, because he's mm. trying to persuade people, but because he's not really trying to persuade people, because he's already made up his mind. So it's, it's just a very curious thing. But, but, you know, he might be right, if not about everything, about almost everything, but he's not effective. Yeah, he's not... Yeah. He's not, he's nothing, you know, he's not changing anything one way or the other because, um, you know, because of his, because of the way he presents the story that where, you know, he closes out anyone listening. He makes it impossible for anyone to, uh, to, um, to take in what he's saying with, you know, uh, um, it, because he's, because he's so harsh. Well, and you close that nicely by not allowing the audience to ask him questions. So he doesn't allow questions at the end. You know, this is it. I'm done. You know, he walks yeah. away. Um, well, you know, I think that how many of us don't want to do that ourselves, you know, when we look around us and it feels like, frankly, here we are in Southern California and it's burning down around us, right? In California, the whole Northwest, right? How, how many of us don't feel like that sometimes that we want to just say, everything's burning down. What is wrong with you? Why are you paying attention, people? So in some ways, I, you know, can kind of relate to his pessimistic speech that he's telling the world, it's too late. You messed up. No, I, I, I do too. I, I, I mean, also it's his rage. Yep. And who doesn't have that rage? I, you know, he, he can relate he, to it. He has that rage and he, um, yes, the, the, and, the, and it's consuming him, actually. I mean, that's, <laughs> the, that's the thing. He, that's all he's become, you know, is this, is this angry, hopeless person um, doing what he's doing, uh, as he says, because he, for his grandchildren, really, and, and yeah. with the idea that he wants to be able to have something to tell them when they say, where were you when, when there was a chance for this to, to go in another direction? And, and he- Did you speak hoping, up? Yeah. Yes, and he's hoping that they, that, that they will forgive him for being mm -hmm. part of the generation that, that blew it. Mm -hmm. I want to change the, the subject real quick. And I want to talk about childhood. There's a scene in the book where the narrator is talking about when, when a group of children sing together out of key, it is the most beautiful sound in the world. And when they rehearse it and they sing it perfectly, it's not as beautiful because they, they had to work so hard. It's not, a, they're not having as much fun. Where did that come from? It's just something that I've observed. I mean, you, you, if you, you know, if, if there is a situation where children are all singing together unrehearsed um, because that's what just because that's what they're doing in the classroom or whatever and mm -hmm. um, you know they tend to sing very loudly some of them have have some of them are, are you know in key some of them aren't but it's a happy making activity so it sounds it sounds quite wonderful if if you know a bit cacophonous when, right, they're, right. when they're when they're part of some kind of chorus or performance and they've rehearsed they do sound like angels. I mean, child children's voices are beautiful, but it, it to the to the narrator, it, to the person, not the narrator, the friend who tells this story, um, she says it isn't it isn't as wonderful exactly because you, as you said because it's beautiful, but they it's you know they, it isn't as wonderful to hear because it's not like they're just free and having so much fun and not caring. Uh, right. They certainly don't care. Yeah. Uh, what they sound like when they're singing, when they're singing the happy song, when they're, when they're, you know, when they're playing. And then thank you. Forgive me. I said the narrator, I meant the, the friend. And, and isn't that kind of like coming full circle for her? She, you know, she has terminal cancer and she's remembering these happy times in childhood. She remembers the book bag and she can name every teacher she had in prim primary school, first and last names of these people in her lives. And yet we can't remember our college professors. And that was, you know, more recent. So I, I love how this brought her life kind of full circle for us as a reader. It was a beautiful way to experience that feeling that I would imagine you would have if you are dying. You know, you go back well, she, to those yeah, that, innocent memories. She she says she says to the narrator, you know, you go back, you go back, you you keep thinking there's some key there, mm. you're searching for a key. That made some sense to me, and um, 
Mm -hmm. And yeah, she, she does start thinking about when she was a, a child, but particularly a school child, because she, for her, it was, it was really, it was such a happy time for her. Um, yeah. You know, so, so, um, again, it was just something that I, you know, that isn't taken from, from life anywhere. I haven't heard anyone say all that. It was just something that I imagined what, what might be mm. going through her head at that time. Mm. Well, this is a beautiful book. Um, we're coming to an end, so I have one final question. What do you have in store for us next? Well, I don't know. I, I, uh, um, I finished this a year ago, and, um, you know, I was, I don't, well, I can't quite remember what I was working on. Um, I was actually working on some nonfiction. I was working on a review essay when the whole nightmare began of the of the of the pandemic and the whole you know here in new york where you know we were the epicenter um so that was so yeah. disruptive and then i have tried a little to do some writing it hasn't really worked out and i i think it's i think it's just because this has all been so overwhelming for everybody and everything is changing um all the time and i don't know i don't know what kind of world uh i'm in right now or you're yeah. in or any of us are in right now. It's just very different. Everything is different. Everything has changed and is still changing. So I just feel like I have to I have to get some kind of hold on that before I know what what I can write. Mm. Even if I'm not gonna be writing about it. Um sure. you know, I just I it's just not the right time. So I don't know what I'm going to uh, be be working on next. Something though. But it, some it but it will I imagine it will affect your next book, especially I since when you sit to. down, yeah, you just start writing. So I imagine you're working on that book right now. You just don't realize it. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Actually, that's a good way to look at it. I will feel, it may help me feel productive. That's right. My writing coach, Marnie Friedman, always tells me, staring out the window counts. It does. It mm -hmm. absolutely does. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. Sigrid Nunes, Thank you so much. This has been a, a wonderful conversation. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank thank you. you very much. Yeah. I enjoyed it very much too. That was really good. <laughs> I could, we could sit here all night and listen to you two ladies talk, but you know, we have to, we have to get on with the program. We have to so wrap it up. I know. We have to wrap it up. <laughs> I know. It's one of the, it's one of the drags of when you have such great authors and, and Jennifer, you conduct a great conversation. So thank you. Um, we got a question from the audience here. Sarah is asking, and she's referring back to uh, one of the uh, quotes that you talked about earlier. If Faulkner said the author's job is to uplift, uplift the reader, what do you say is the job of an author? Do you agree with Faulkner or would you define the author's role in a different way? Um, I don't know that I've ever really agreed that it was the, the writer's job to, um, to lift people up. Um, I think that the writer's job is, is to, I mean, what does it, what does a writer, he, he's talking about fiction writing. Um, you know, what is that? That is, that is a writer sitting down to, to uh, present his or her vision of some aspect of human experience. And that's the writer's job. You know, to observe and tell a story, and uh, and 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 tell the reader how he or she sees the world, what what he or she has discovered about human experience that seems worthy and true and worth sharing. Mm -hmm. But it, I don't think it goes beyond that. I mean, it might be something that lifts someone up. It might. I mean, is everything going to lift everyone up? I mean, you know, there's a, there's quite a possibility that what lifts you up doesn't lift that person up. But, but I don't. I don't think, you know, I don't think I would ever say that 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 the writer has, you know, any particular um, uh, job to to lift people up. There's a there's a there's a place in in my book where um, where that, you know, the the lecturer says to the narrator, um, if every poet sat down and write, wrote a, a poem about climate change tomorrow, it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, save one tree. Mm. And my narrator doesn't say this, but I say to him, it is not the poet's job to save trees. <laughs> 
this poet's Amen job to write poetry. So, and so, you know, there's a similar idea. I understand where that comes from, mm -hmm. but I, I, don't, I don't agree with it. Interesting. Um, so I have a question. So during this lockdown and writing and everything, so it, the writing has been a little bit hard to do. So have you been reading? Were you able to read? Who do you, who do you read that um, you'd you? like to share with us? Yeah. Well, I've actually had a, you know, when the, when the pandemic started, I, I, uh, you know, a very bad thing for me was that I, I had a lot of trouble reading. It was, it was so did really I. It was hard to concentrate. It was really hard to concentrate. It yeah. was really hard to concentrate. Um, and then, you know, but then I, I got, I got back into it. Um, right now I'm reading um, a novel that's just come out called Red Pill by Hari Kunzru. And I'm in the middle of that. Um, and I also, I'm telling you about something I'm very much looking forward to is reading Natasha Trethewey's uh, memoir, Memorial Drive. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, I don't know, I've read a lot. I've, I've been reading, I've also been reading a, a series in the London Review of Books. There's a very beautiful, long series, you know, in, in three issues, a very long um, piece. Each piece is quite long, um, called The Suitcase by a woman named uh, Frances Stoner Saunders. Uh, that, that I've enjoyed a great deal. And I also read a very beautiful book. Um, uh, by Peter Cameron, which came out, I think, in the summer called What Happens at Night. Mm. Um, so, and the es essays, a book of essays by Lydia Davis, because I'm such a huge fan of her fiction. So those were some things. Good, that um, gives some people some, some things to yeah. look to. I love mm -hmm. that. Thank yeah, you. It's, it's always fun to just like, you know, what, what do you pick up to read? Because everybody has their own kind of styles. And um, mm -hmm. can you read, like when you're in the middle of writing, do you read um, fiction too? Or do you stay away from fiction writers when you're in the middle of a book, when you're in the middle of writing? Well, I, 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 read, I read whatever I want. I don't want to be, you know, I, I just, you know, I just read what, whatever I want to read. I don't let whatever I'm working on, you know, stop me from from reading something that I want. Yeah. Nice. Well, this has been an amazing conversation and it has been just such a treat to have you, Sigrid. Like I said earlier, fangirl a little bit, but um, we adore your writing. It is beautiful. It is, there's not a word that is not supposed to be there. Thank it's you just so much. Always fantastic. So good to hear. Yeah, Very it's just nice. fantastic. So for our listeners and viewers who are out there, a um, couple things. I'm going to finish up a little housekeeping things. Um, this is kind of, I know people think, oh, you're a bookstore, you're just trying to push stuff on us. But this truly is an issue that's going to happen this year. Um, there is going to be a supply chain issue that's going to happen with books. Um, I think there was a big article in the New York Times, I think, about it. it. Was. it was. Yeah. Um, and so we are already feeling it. So um, Sigrid's books are always super popular. We have them in stock now. I would suggest you get them now. Um, Pre-order, do whatever, you know, do, eat up our inventory. <laughs> but if you have any idea that you're going to want this book, do it now. Um, we're starting to say that October is the new December because um, you're not going to be able to do that last minute shopping <laughs> um, or December. you're not going to get exactly what you want. So um, do it That's a little bit really <laughs> <laughs> you know, orange is the new black, October is the new December. I mean, <laughs> and who knows what's even going to happen in December, for goodness sake. So, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Um, Jennifer, for you, if people want to um, see what you're doing in the world out there or your musings, where should people look to find you? So people can find me at jenniferthompson.com and they can listen to this. This interview will be on my podcast, The Premise, which you can also find at San Diego Writers Festival.com. Excellent. And Sigrid, do you put yourself out there in any kind of social media or anything? Do you share your musings? I have, I, well, I have a website, sigridnunez.com. That's okay. I don't have it. I'm not on any social media. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So anybody that you find anything there. So again, thank you for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. Hopefully there will be a world someday out there where you can come to San Diego. Yes. And It'll can, happen. Absolutely. It'll, It'll happen. happen. And we okay, will meet in person. You, yes. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye.
Yeah, good night. Good night. <laughs> okay, the live stream has ended.